Good afternoon, and welcome to this webinar on slavery, dispossession, and the way forward for universities. I'm Caleb McDaniel, professor and chair in the history department here at Rice University. And together with my colleague, Vice Provost Alexander Byrd, I am the co-chair of Rice's Task Force on Slavery, Segregation, and Racial Injustice. On behalf of the entire steering committee of the task force, I would like to thank all of you in the audience for joining us today. And I would also like to thank Ryan Kirksey, Jeff Cox, and Lotta Witt-Magborg for their invaluable behind the scenes assistance in preparing today's event. When Rice University President David Lebron commissioned our task force last year, one of the charges he gave us was to develop campus-wide programming to support frank and honest discussion of Rice's entanglement with slavery, segregation, and racial injustice, as well as opportunities for community members to envision paths for Rice moving forward. This will include the invitation of speakers to bring to campus to foster dialogue around these issues. Today's event is the third in a series of events inspired by that charge, and I am particularly excited to hear from our guests today, Professor Deborah Gray White and Professor Marisa Fuentes from Rutgers University, two historians whose scholarship has had a tremendous impact, not only on me personally, but on historians of slavery and racial injustice around the world. Towards the end of today's event, you will also have the opportunity to ask questions to our guest panelists by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We may not be able to answer all of your questions, but we'll select some of them to generate dialogue. Before Professor Byrd introduces each of our guests to you more fully, let me say a few brief words about other upcoming programming sponsored by the Task Force on Slavery, Segregation, and Racial Injustice. First, we'd like to invite you this Friday at noon central to the third in a continuing series of Zoom Doc Talks with myself and Professor Bird. Each Friday this fall, we plan to spend the lunch hour talking about a few of the documents that have been turned up by the task force's research and discussing the questions that each document helps us to answer or ask about the university's history, from business records involving William Marsh Rice that mention enslaved people by name, to photographs and documents about the first African-American students at Rice University and everything in between. Please also be on the lookout for information about upcoming webinar panels this October and November about the black student experience at Rice and the legal battle to admit black students to the university. You'll be able to find Zoom meeting IDs and passcodes for these events, as well as for the Friday Doc Talks on our task force website where you can also find a video of our summer webinar entitled Monuments, Movements, and Racism on Campus. So please visit taskforce.rice.edu to learn more about what we're doing and find ways to join in our work. That's taskforce.rice.edu. Professor Bird? I'm delighted to introduce our panelists today. Dr. Deborah Gray White is Board of Governors Distinguished Professor of History at Rutgers University, where she has been based since 1984. She is a leading historian of African American history and women's and gender history in the United States. Her pathbreaking study, Aren't I a Woman? Female Slaves in the Plantation South, is a field defining volume now in a second revised edition and is recognized across the country for its singular contributions to U.S. history. Professor White is also the author of Too Heavy a Load, Black Women in Defense of Themselves, editor of Telling Histories, Black Women Historians in the Ivory Tower, and author of Lost in the USA, a study of turn-of-the-century American identity from the vantage of the era's mass protest. Professor White has chaired the History Department at Rutgers, co-directed the groundbreaking seminar on the Black Atlantic at the Rutgers Center for Historical Analysis. She is the recipient of the Carter G. Woodson Medallion given by the Association for the Study of African American Life and History and the winner of a John, si John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship. Of course, she is the chair of the Committee on Enslaved and Disenfranchised Populations in, in Rutgers History and co-editor of the two volumes to come out of that work thus far, Scarlet and Black. Marisa J. Fuentes 
is Associate Professor of Women's and Gender History and Presidential Term Chair in African American History at Rutgers University, where she has been since 2009. Dr. Fuentes is the author of the prize-winning Dispossessed Lives, Enslaved Women, Violence, and the Archive, a study of women, power, violence, and historical method focused on colonial Barbados. This remarkable study won both the Barbara T. Christian Best Humanities Book Prize and the Berkshire's Conference of Women Historians First Book Prize. Professor Fuentes' essay, Power and Historical Figuring, Rachel Pringle, Rachel Pringle Paul Green's Troubled Archive, was awarded the Andres Ramos Mati Neville Hall Article Prize by the Association of Caribbean Historians. Dr. Fuentes has won fellowships from the Ford Foundation, Fulbright, the Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History, and the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. She is completing a term on the Council of the Omohundro Institute and is, of course, Director of Research for the Scarlet and Black Project and co-editor of their two volumes on Rutgers history. Welcome. I thought that we'd start with a question about um, origins. Um, how did the Scarlet and Black Project begin? What, what drew you to the work? What potentialities did you see in it? And, and to what extent have those potentialities been realized? I'll take that question first. Um, uh, in the fall of 2015, um, the chancellor at New Brunswick, uh, uh, Chancellor um, Richard Edwards, came to me, uh, well, actually he met with some students and the students, some Rutgers students, some minority students. And then at that time they told him that they really didn't feel a part of Rutgers. They felt rather disaffected that, um, you know, they wanted Rutgers to do what some other universities were doing, that they wanted uh, Rutgers to actually look into its history of, uh, the history of African Americans at the uni at the university. Um, at that time, um, let's see. Uh, Craig Wilder had published the book uh, *Ebony and Ivy* about uh, black people at the Ivies, and he had put forth the thesis that uh, you know, if you're really going to look at uh, who who had um, had supported slavery at the early history of this country that you needed to look at the universities and how the universities had uh, played a very large part in upholding in establishing slavery as well as um, upholding the institution through the uh, 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. Um, Edwards contacted me and that was in the fall of 2015 and uh, um, Rutgers was coming upon its 250th anniversary. And he said, um, I have to say, I, 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 I listened to him with some disbelief at the time. You know, he would really like to see a volume produced so that uh, that actually looked at this history. And when he said he would like to have it for 2016, <laughs> um, I, I was like uh, a little incredulous, uh, are you kidding? Rutgers was founded in 1766, so the 250th anniversary would have been then. Um, bottom line is, um, we have a wonderful history department and we have really wonderful students. So um, after sort of flailing around and trying to figure out how to do this, uh, we decided, um, at least I decided, first of all, a couple of people came to me. Um, um, Dr. Fuentes came and volunteered her services. Uh, our Native American specialist said, yeah, if you need any help in this, uh, I will help you. The university archivist said, um, oh, listen, uh, any help that you need. And I mean, this was wonderful because they came to me um, and offered their help. We also have a, uh, on, on the Rutgers campus is the New Brunswick Theological Seminary. And for those of you who are listening who don't know uh, 
Rutgers University started out as a uh, sort of a sister school to the uh, New Brunswick Theological Seminary. So um, they also at the time were beginning an undertaking of their history with African-Americans. And so one of the professors there, Professor John Coakley said, you know, whatever help you need um, from us, we will open our library, we will um, help you with any kind of research. As it turned out, um, with our graduate students, we um, managed to send each, you know, give graduate students a task, send them into the archives. Uh, the university was um, smart enough, wise enough to pay these students uh, to do this kind of research. So our graduate students were able to um, focus in, they worked in teams. And um, by midsummer of the following year, they had come up not only with research, but also with um, some preliminary articles. Uh, Dr. Fuentes and I took those articles, edited them. And so we had the uh, very first volume. We will do, I will send it <laughs> uh, of, uh, of Scarlet and Black at that time. So that's how it, it began. I might just add, in terms of potential and what has been realized since, I think um, one of the things that is most important is that the quality of the work, according to the administration, convinced them to continue to support the project, right? So that we can have three volumes of this, um, of this work that extends from this colonial period to the early 2000s, really um, going through, you know, the crucial 20th century. Um, and the other thing I would say is that at the end of volume one, there were, there were suggestions and recommendations for the university. Um, some of them were historical markers around campus where these, um, you know, people tied to slave ownership and the slave trade would be sort of contextualized on campus. Um, there was uh, a request that the university take on a diversity requirement, which we still have yet to have the faculty approve, um, although it's come up several times. So some of the things have gotten realized, the app, the digital project, while other things were still sort of working through as we, uh, as we complete the third volume. Mm -hmm. And just to add to that, um, let's say um, very early on, I mean, this, uh, w when it was first proposed, the project is massive. Even um, since at the very beginning, when, when I agreed to do this, I thought, um, First of all, as I said, I was like, you, you've got to be kidding. This is really, really, really a very huge project. But what the university did was to divide the, um, to divide the work on reparations, you know, in, in, definite, in reclaiming the history and then reparations. They divided it into two different committees. And I think... Um, Strategically, that was, that was wise on the university's part um, so that the committee on, um, disen on the history of the, dis of the disenfranchised uh, at Rutgers was one committee. But then the second committee was a, a committee on inclusion and diversity. So, uh, and that committee was charged with figuring out what to do for the current students at Rutgers and projects that the university ought to undertake currently to um, make students like those that came in and talked to um, Chancellor Edwards in 2015, that can make those students feel whole. All right, so while we focused on the history, um, this particular committee focused on, okay, what do we do now? And, um, you know, so even though at the end of volume one, we did have a list of recommendations and as 
um, Dr. Puente says, we wanted, you know, we wanted them to uh, be proactive about um, having a diversity course and about scholarships and uh, about inclusion of, you know, an appointment of more faculty and things like this. These these recommendations were also made by this other committee of inclusion and diversity. Um, they they uh, advised getting more uh, faculty of color. They advised um, having a center for African uh, American studies. Um, they advised things like like having a diversity requirement and a host of other um, recommendations that they made. Um, I will say that we do have a new president who has promised to come through on some of these um, recommendations made by this committee. Uh, he has made note of a, uh, a scarlet and black fund. We're not sure what, where that's going or what that really means. He's only been in office since July and since uh, the COVID uh, epidemic has um, pretty much shut the university down, at least, except for what's going online. You know, we'll have to wait to see where, where that is all going. Um, but, but as I saw it, I just, um, it seemed to me that it was important first to get the history down, just to figure out, okay, what, um, not only what Rutgers did, regarding the era of slavery, but what was that legacy as African-Americans in Rutgers um, have come through the century? Yeah. Thank you for that introduction to the project. Um, I think we have to confess to, to borrowing the title of our webinar in part from an early news release that I think the chancellor made back in 2015 about Rutgers. Uh, that the headline on your website was slavery, dispossession, and the way forward for Rutgers. And so uh, in this conversation, as we, we think about Rice and, and also about Rutgers and other universities that have embarked on this work, uh, I wanted to broaden that, that title and topic out a little bit. Um, the word dispossession, I was a little interested in, in the origins of that that term in the project and also whether you could share some with the audience what that word means and how it figures into the work that you're doing. I know that uh, in your scholarship, Dr. Fuentes, in the title of your book, uh, that's also an important uh, term and, and way to think about this history. Could you say a little bit more about uh, what dispossession means in the context of this kind of historical recovery? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so first, I mean, with the first volume in particular, uh, dispossession recognizes that that first volume also included the Lenin and Lenape and the history of them being moved off and out of the region um, on, you know, with it, where Rutgers is now built, right? So it's a, it's a term that really recognized people being displaced and uh, dispossessed of, of their uh, land and community um, in that. And so I'm thinking about my own work and when I use that term in the title, it was specifically to think about how people are removed from history and removed from the archives. So a kind of historical dispossession, if you will. So I think, you know, as other universities really grapple with this history, I think we all have to grapple with um, indigenous displacement. Um, and I know some of it is recognizing when, when we come together to sort of acknowledge that uh, we are on, you know, sovereign land of a particular uh, indigenous group, but more than that, right, this is their legacy as well. And so um, that is that in keeping that idea in the title kind of um, makes it part of the history of slavery as well, makes it part of the ongoing project. And I, I don't know, I don't, I don't know that I have the answer for um, how to do that work simultaneously because there was, historically speaking, you know, a period of time when people were removed from the land, right? And then the sort of history of slavery uh, sort of came up and that history of African-American 
um, presence and not presence, both in New Brunswick and the university, was the story that sort of came out, right? That, that we were able to carry through to the present moment. Um, but I think, you know, dispossession is a powerful word um, that can mean uh, someone's attachment to the land and being prevented from, but it also is, is thinking about histories that have been silenced over time. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, I think it's important um, if we take um, Dr. Fuente's definition um, of this word dispossessed and we look at um, people who've been removed from history and removed from the, from the archive, one of the things that we recovered in this very first volume is a guy, a guy an enslaved person named Will. I mean, one of the things that these students in 2015 wanted to see was, uh, you know, where they stood in the history of African Americans. Well, uh, it's hard to believe that there would not have been African Americans or enslaved, both enslaved and free, involved in the building of uh, Rutgers University. And indeed, uh, having been removed from the archive, uh, what one of the things that we were able to do was to recover a, a uh, a, a ledger, it was a book of a dentist who actually was paying for his, um, who was paid for the wages of, well, he was paid the wages of Will, and Will worked on the foundation building of Rutgers. So Old Queens, which houses uh, the administrative offices of the president of the university, um, we know that will that at least once one enslaved person so and if there was one enslaved person there was probably many more but by here we were able to recover that and okay we don't have a um a statue like we do of so many of the dutch slaveholders on the campus but we do now have a marker that says um that says you know will uh, and we've renamed a uh, a walkway, the walkway around the um, the Oakland's building. We've renamed it for Will. We've also, and this was history hiding in plain sight, um, Johannes Hardenberg, the family of the Hardenbergs, and they were founders of Rutgers. They owned um, the parents, and therefore they owned Sojourner Truth. So, and here we know so much about. So during the truth, uh, as an abolitionist and as a feminist, um, what one of the things we were able to do, again, um, we were dispossessed of that history, but in, in looking at that history of Rutgers, we were able to, s s to see the ties that um, had, uh, uh, the Hardenbergs had to Sojourner Truth. Well, um, they did name a um, apartment building, a dormitory after Sojourner Truth, which is kind of interesting in as much as her parents, you know, uh, were, were uh, housed in the basement of a hotel that had mud floors. So um, uh, rather ironic, but very telling. So those are the, some of the kinds of things that we're able to do um, besides just revealing the history of some of Rutgers founders as, as slave owners. We were able to recall and to um, put back these black figures into the history of Rutgers University. And we've done that now all the way um, to uh, 2020. The second volume of uh, Scarlet in Black is entitled uh, Constructing Race and Gender at Rutgers, 1865 to 1945. And the final volume that is uh, on its way to the publisher, Scarlet and Black, um, Making Black Lives Matter at Rutgers, 1945 to the present. That's phenomenal. Um, that's, um... Those th three volumes are just um, massive in, 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 in time and, and scope. And I, I wonder if we 
if, if you could um, talk now, um, either or both of you, about the, the ways that th this scholarship and this engagement with graduate students and undergraduates, um, how has it um, affected uh, the, these students and individually and as a, a emerging scholars? Um, but also curious if, it's, if this project as it has unfolded has affected the, the structure of graduate and undergraduate education uh, at the at the university as as well. Um, thank you again. Um, I will say that one of the things that we are incredibly proud of is the the research and writing that our graduate students have done. Um, that this project, from you know many in their first year, followed it to their fifth year, have been part of this. Um, development since the beginning, and they have been a phenomenal. Um, the things that they've found, the way that they've organized um, the research thematically, the ideas they've come up with to write these essays. So in terms of, of having them have a really kind of hands-on research experience, um, it's been incredible. It's public history as well. So we're thinking that um, a few of them have sort of launched out into the world and all of these students are coming out with a publication. Um, and so that has been really incredible for them um, on the market and, and in postdocs. Um, so there's that sort of tangible thing. Um, I know, and I haven't taught myself, but I know that our former student who had been part of this project, but he's in, um, he's just, he's finished and he's part of the digital archive. Um, so he does all kinds of um, the digital project of this and will carry on the life of this project as the volumes are done. Um, he actually taught an undergrad class um, and trained undergrads with this material how to do an online exhibit. So again, a kind of practical, really amazing, something I couldn't have done because um, of my <laughs> bad tech skills, but so that the, the undergrads could actually take history and see it applied in a digital form um, and learn coding in that regard and learn presentation of historical information. So they're leaving with that, right? Um, that practical thing. I mean, I think one of the, the, one of the important things is for, for, for me at least is to really kind of continue to press um, and maybe through this project and the material that we've been able to come up with is to continue to press a diversity requirement um, throughout the university because uh, even if it is, I mean, certainly we have across curriculum courses that could count for this, right? But how wonderful would it be to have every student take a class on Rutgers history um, and understand what it is to be there and what the struggles have been for students of color over the, over the centuries. Um, so I would say that's, that's something that I think um, could continue to be pressed and would affect the sort of widest group of students um, at, at Rutgers. Mm -hmm. Well, I would add to that, um, first of all, well, a couple of things. Um, our undergraduates were also involved in this project. The very first article that appears in the first volume, uh, our Native Americanist, uh, uh, Professor Camilla Townsend, took a tw her class, her undergraduate seminar class on Native Americans and gave them a project of looking and, it, and actually doing all of the research on the removal of Native Americans from the land that Rutgers is built on. And so, and if you look at that, the, each one of those students is listed as an author in that first volume. And, um, you know, I, I can speak to the, the experience that undergraduates have because I also taught a seminar um, and the his, uh, Scarlet and Black seminar for um, this third volume that we're putting out. And I had my students going into the special collections and looking at uh, these primary sources and writing 
uh, pieces on on uh, Rutgers history from 1945 to the present. In fact, two of our students will uh, the two two of their articles will appear in the second volume. Uh, one wrote on um, the examine the letters that were written to the president after a student takeover of one of of of, Con of Conklin Hall in Newark and the other student wrote on um, the Black House and how Black students had been um, patrolled and uh, policed at Rutgers during a particular period. And uh, so uh, I have to say that every student wished that they had taken this course not in their junior year because we offer this seminar in the junior and senior year, but they wish that they had started Rutgers, uh, started during their freshman year because it, it was the first time that they actually got to really do history. And they, were, they came out of the course really uh, terribly excited. The other thing I say about our graduate students is that many of them, many of them were not African-American specialists. This is not their area. So they wanted to get involved in the project, and they uh, and they did. And most of them, in fact, were 20th century students. And yet they realized just um, how valuable their research skills were because they were able to transfer all of their research skills and everything that they had learned from going and looking at um, 20th century sources all the way back into the 17th and 18th century. And these, these are not easy, this is not easily done. It's, you know, the, the uh, penmanship, <laughs> first of all, you have penmanship that you have to deal with because everything is not written or typewritten. And then you have um, just uh, words, old English words, but every student came out of this um, truly fascinated uh, with the fact not only that, oh my God, I, just because I do 20th century history or just because I do um, uh, Japanese history or South Asian history doesn't mean I can't also do this. And that, that was, um, you know, that was, and, and you know, they, they come out with a publication which is really great on the market. And I would just underscore um, what Dr. Fuentes said about public history. I think for all of us, myself included, uh, this was really an education in what we do for the public in terms of uh, developing resources for museums, um, doing the archive and doing the digital project. Um, and actually a few of our students, in fact, two of our students did get um, fellowships that, uh, with, with museums and in the field of public history. I would add, I would add one more thing just to um, underscore also kind of going back on what Deborah's saying is, is the attention to the archive at Rutgers. The majority of the research was in Rutgers University Library Archives to be able to, and then, you know, I think uh, Dr. White would agree with me that we're scratching the surface of this history. If I had my way, I would have written, I would have had three volumes on slavery. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's not how it works, I get it. But that there's so much more um, to, to, to work to do in these archives. And the hope is that these volumes bring attention to the wider community about what Rutgers has um, and, and the resources available here locally. Right. And in fact, our, um, it, unfortunately, because the campus is closed, um, I imagine, well, not I imagine, I know that a lot of this has slowed down and it's just not happening, but we had many high school students and many high school classes coming in, um, taking advantage of the, the redeveloped tours that we give now. Um, and that we've not only helped change the tour the regular tour, you know, the, the high school tour that anybody who's, who's uh, thinking about Rutgers, we've been able to integrate our material 
into that tour in a, re in a relatively seamless way. But also we do give special tours uh, for students who are interested in African-Americans at Rutgers. And these are conducted by students and they were developed by the students. I know Dr. McDaniel has a, another question to pose, but I just wanted to um, remind the audience to go ahead and put your questions into the Q&A function because we'll, we'll, we'll pose those soon. And, and also just want to um, tell the audience that if you have your phone with you, you can go to the whatever, whatever app store you, your phone has and, and search Scarlet and Black and you'll, you'll see the, the Scarlet and Black um, um, phone app related to, to some of the work um, that we've been talking about. Thanks, Dr. Bird. And the question that I was going to pose actually has, has just been posed in, in the Q&A, and it relates to the origin story that you were telling about how some students came to uh, the chancellor in, in 2015 and, and expressed a feeling of, of not belonging at Rutgers and, and, and seeking some, some redress. And so the question is, how has the Rutgers general Black student body adopted or embraced the work of the project? And is there a particular document or, or discovery in your work that you think reveals the importance of this kind of historical scholarship for addressing some of the questions that those students were raising at the beginning of the project? I, I will say that this spring, I was contacted by the Rutgers student body president um, who wanted to talk about volume one. Uh, and so, you know, that was 2016, it's 2020. So he was a rising senior and said, I want to do something big in my last year as president. Um, and, and this isn't speaking specifically to the, to the kind of wider black student population, but certainly they represent all student groups and constituencies on campus when he said, we want to figure out a way to, to tackle reparations. Um, and I talked to him about, and, and particularly around um, this story in volume one, where there was two women that signed permission to be sold to Louisiana after the gradual emancipation in New Jersey was passed. So that they're, and they were both uh, mothers of infants so that their children would have become free. But there was some sort of uh, Middlesex County Courthouse. I, I think something else uh, needs to be dug into here. I would say a conspiracy of sorts that uh, convinced them it was okay to sign their life and that of their child away to be sold um, to Louisiana. And the, and the student body president said, can we find those descendants? can we find those people to then figure out ways to give back to them in much the same way he was thinking about Georgetown. Um, and I said, you know, I said a lot of things to him, but I also said, you know, I think you need more than a year <laughs> of, of work because, you know, this kind of archival work is incredibly hard and then tracing it to uh, Louisiana, all of that. And I said, but given that this, this, this summer has been really incredibly um, powerful in Black student protest and, and visibility and, a, you know, bringing this struggle to the, the wider I would say international attention, maybe you can think about ways to, to do something about social and racial justice. Reparations, I can talk, we can talk for days about that and I, I have ideas about it, but social justice as, as, a, as a more feasible thing to do in a short term um, while you're still on campus and whatever that means for the present um, population. Um, you can be creative about that. But um, so those are some of the things that I had been privy to in terms of the undergraduate population. But I think uh, Professor White might have something else to say. The only thing I would say in answer to the question is that when we, when we um, initially rolled out the first volume in 2016, the, um, the response was overwhelming. We had, we filled up our multi-purpose room and the multi-purpose room at Rutgers seats over 700 students. And then we had um, 
we had a, a, a spillover room. So it was, it, it, the reception was really, really, really quite incredible. Um, and I would, uh, for though I, I do think it's really important and I'm very glad, although um, I'm very glad, even given the amount of work that it has taken that we now have the third volume because, you know, there was just a trickle of black students, the legacy of enslavement and the legacy of segregation and discrimination continued all the way to around 1969, 1968. And to see what these students, uh, the, what Rutgers students, I mean, we know, you know, there were loads of demonstrations in 1968. They were uh, anti-Vietnam demonstrations. But what the students in 1968 and 1969 did in that very, in a very short period of time, I would, I really want our students to read that and read it very carefully because these are the students that brought not only um, African American studies to Rutgers, but also brought black students to Rutgers. They made demands about um, inclusion that included not just students, but also included faculty and staff. And they took over a building at great cost at great cost and at great sacrifice and at great risk. These, this is what these students were willing to do to make sure that they were included in Rutgers, um, in Rutgers going forward. That I think is a powerful example of what students can do and what students ought to do. Um, we can give them the history and we can talk all day about work uh, about things coming from the top down, about a, a chancellor saying, let's do this, about professors saying, let's do this. But it's really the students that are really going to um, have to mobilize and decide um, that this is what we want. They did it in 1968 and 69 at Rutgers. And it really changed things quite significantly. So, you know, um, I'd like to see them take particularly this third volume and use it in that way and say, you see, they did it, we can do it too. We've got um, a couple of questions in the chat about broader reactions to the work um, outside of the, the Rutgers campus, particularly with uh, alumni. Uh, so, so one question, just what the general alumni or what types of alumni reaction ha have there been? And, and one question that focuses on whether there has been um, a, a alumni criticism um, because of the ways that the, a project like this will invariably um, contrast with, with some alumni's um, memories of their, of their alma maters. Um, so if you could talk some about uh, alumni, but, but also dealing with um, any alumni um, criticism that you might, might have faced. Um, to be honest, I mean, uh, the alumni that I have had um, contact with have been very uh, supportive of this. In particular, the um, African-American alumni, Puerto Rican alumni. I will say this, I'm not naive. And so when we were doing a dedication for the Sojourner Truth home, uh, Houses, and when we also dedicated the, um, uh, the Will Walkway, I asked campus security to make sure that there were, uh, that they doubled the amount of security. And they did not say to me that there were, you know, that there had been complaints. All I know is that as I said, I, um, I wasn't born yesterday and I know that there's probably uh, criticism out there. By and large, that, that um, you know, the response that I have received, personal that I know about, um, has been very positive. As well as from the administration, not just from um, alumni, but also the administration. Uh, they have continued to support this and they've given us an incredible amount of support. 
I'll just add to that there was work, I'm thinking it was the first volume, but it could have been, I think it was the second actually, where Douglas College, the, the women's college on campus had been about to celebrate its 100 year anniversary in 2018. So they also um, gave resources for us to have a sort of dedicated chapter on Douglas and the, the first students of color on campus. Um, and, you know, we were able to do that. I, I don't know that we satisfied because the alumni group was absolutely a part of that. And some of these, um, you know, the buildings or the college's name have controversial people attached to them, um, particularly Douglas College. And so I think the, the object or as historians, what we were trying to do is just give them the information and then, um, you know, it, it's up to them what they want to do with it and how they react to it. I, I think Deborah actually has had much more interaction with alumni groups. Um, the, I should also mention that uh, the students have been doing a public um, project with the AME Church in New Brunswick. Um, so this historically black church that has archives um, that we've utilized extensively in this project they've been incredibly supportive of any work that we've done with them, including um, digitizing some of their archives, absolutely including the fact that Rutgers is in a city, right? And the city um, is part of that history, um, particularly uh, black citizens of that city. Um, so being able to have public constituencies that both um, have a, a stake in, but also benefit from this work has been really um, incredible and powerful. Thank you for that. We have a couple of other questions that have come up, I think, uh, partly in response to the, the subject of Georgetown, which you mentioned earlier, and also the question of reparations. And so one question that's been raised is about whether you anticipate that, that more universities will follow uh, Georgetown in offering free or discounted tuition to uh, the descendants of enslaved people, or whether more people should be eligible to gain from uh, the offer of a significantly discounted college education as a result of, of this kind of work. And a related question had to do with uh, whether that has been the subject of conversation at, at Rutgers with any donors um, you know, expressing support for that kind of work. I can say, um, I mean, I'm not privy to um, whether, you know, other donors and, you know, what goes on when, in terms of conversations when people come to donate. Um, however, I do know that in the, um, that during, when we, when we were putting this whole thing together, loads of groups wanted to us to include them on, and, and uh, so to the point where we really had to make uh, some decisions about uh, how many um, disaffected people uh, we, could, we could bring into this. And so uh, definitely we knew we had to deal with Native Americans. And we also knew that we had to deal with, um, with African Americans. But uh, in particular uh, with the third volume we dealt, um, we dealt quite extensively with, well, not quite, so none of this has been as extensive as it could be or that we would want to be, but it's as extensive at, it is as extensive as we could make it. Certainly, uh, we've had to include uh, Puerto Rican groups because uh, Puerto Rican students in the 1960s and 1970s were incredibly supportive in not just creating African-American studies, but in creating um, minority studies. Um, we were unable to include other groups that really wanted, in particular, um, American Jewish people um, and students. This is a subject that, uh, as, as a, um, particularly with, uh, with Douglas College, is quite relevant. And so I do think, though, that other groups of uh, and and other minorities as well as other ethnic groups will also be taking this up, and they might use 
Scarlet and Black as a model for how to do it. There's been a there's been a question that is is directed toward the the Rice co-chairs that I'll, I'll just answer live quickly and it and it and basically says um, can we please be like Rutgers and um, publish some volumes on, on on Rice Rice history so that's a that's an asking of the question it isn't quite an answering of the question Dr McDaniel um, but I, I I will tell. Um, the, the folks in the audience that at this point um, we, we will publish a, a, a report that will um, definitely contain aspects of the of the history that that we uncover um, whether we move from there to um, um, specific volume publications I'm, I'm going to uh, we'll, we'll punt to the research and and, and teaching um, working group um, I, I know there are folks on the steering committee that would be excited um, uh, about about that. Um, we have a, a this a, a, another question about um, structure and uh, a, about structure moving forward. But we, we have someone in the audience who has asked whether y'all have considered um, doing any NEH um, um, type seminars on the, on the project for um, for teachers, um, public school teachers, and also um, college college teachers. I don't think we've been asked. We I I have not considered it because um, and I have done uh, NEH um, programs, summer programs, but we have not been uh, approached with a re with that kind of request. I have not been. I haven't either. <laughs> so this is the first request, but it's not coming from the NEH. It's coming from someone in Houston who is eager to come up to New Brunswick for, for that seminar. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, Dr. McDaniel, we are, we are running in on the time where if we're going to be super nice to the people who Zoom 8, 12, 14 meetings a day, that we try to give them at least five minutes before um, the hour so folks can at least at least stretch, stretch um, and grab another cup of coffee. I want to really thank um, Professor White and Professor Fuentes for visiting with us today. It's been a remarkable um, conversation about Scarlet and Black, but it's also just as, as historians, it's just, it's wonderful to be in a room, even if it's just a Zoom room, um, with some of the best historians in the country. And I, I, I really appreciate th this opportunity to, um, to listen to y'all and to share with y'all today. Here, Dr. Here. Thank you so much. Thank right. you. Thanks, thanks, thanks an awful lot for having us. Absolutely. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And thanks as well again to everyone in the audience for taking some time to spend with us today. We hope that you will visit our website at taskforce.rice.edu to find out about more upcoming events this fall and to find out how you can join in the work that we're doing here at Rice uh, to follow in the, the tremendous footsteps of uh, universities like Rutgers and the Scarlet and Black Project. Thank you again and have a great afternoon. Okay. You too. Thank you.